I was born in St Neots. We lived in uh, a council house at the north end of St Neots, at the back of the cricket pitch. All those houses were built in about 1947. I lived there on and off until I was about 38. St Neots was quite small then, and it was still quite rural looking. You know, that, that expression, or I remember this when it was all fields, was, it was absolutely right. Where I went to secondary school wasn't built. That was wheat fields and we used to go and watch the harvest there. Places like Priory Hill were privately owned and so there was a big area of woodland. And it was really interesting, I had gamekeepers still. But it was quite idyllic looking. And there was the river as well which had old-fashioned traps, uh, which was like a walkway across so you could get over to Paxton even when it was flooded. And it still had a cattle market and a produce market, which were great. So they were really interesting to see as a child. You know, my mum used to take me to the cattle market and I could stare through the breeze blocks to see the pigs and the calves and things like that. The farmers from Bedfordshire uh, would come in and sometimes animals would escape, which was always good for a bit of uh, excitement. When a ram got out of the pen and ran into the street and everything. First went to art college, uh, I went on a, a foundation course to Leicester Poly. That was odd, really, because it wasn't like school where you were taught to draw and, and paint and sort of think about things in a very, you know, quite a traditional way, really. Art college was sort of uh, quite a lot of conceptual work becoming fashionable. So it was all questioning everything and exploring different media and things like that, which I found very limited in interest, really. I couldn't wait to get home <laughs> at weekends and uh, in the holidays and things like that. I didn't, I didn't particularly like where I was staying anyway. I liked, I liked my fellow students, you know, it was a good laugh and um, I was quite sociable and made some good friends. But, um, I just found it, I always felt rather more manipulated than actually enjoying making decisions about something. It was funny really because I'd gone all the way through art college and I still, I didn't feel as if I was that committed. It happened in the last year of my art education, really. I was on a postgraduate year in, in Birmingham and I went to the theatre. I saw uh, Michael Tippett's opera, A Midsummer Marriage. And there was a little quotation in the programme. Um, I can't even remember it now. It was my epiphany, really, and I knew that's what I had to do, I had to be an artist. As an artist, I'm naturally cautious and you have to be very careful about uh, organising money. It, or it comes down to money, the availability of. Sometimes I've made a reasonable amount of money sometimes I've made nothing. So you just, it's a, it's a feast and famine existence, it has always been for me. You get used to it, you just adapt really. I'm not particularly extravagant in my tastes. As long as I can have enough materials, I'm warm enough. My interests are mostly quite local to the area as far as work's concerned. So compared to quite a few artists, it's a lifestyle that I've adapted to quite easily. It's my complete uh, reason to be. 
it's like when chefs go on master chefs and they say oh i think about food all the time well i gauge the world as far as recording it visually or thinking about it in a as, in terms of art what first inspired me was uh I think really my close proximity to two sites of the A14. They're both within walking distance. And I've always rather believed in art in your own backyard. So it was an ideal opportunity, really. I had this idea that I wanted to take the view of the man in the street rather than yeah, exclusive access. My view is that I'm making my art accessible to as many people as I can. My art often does relate to sources from art history and uh, other cultural references in general, really. Uh, poetry and literature. There's one particular picture called River Crossing. I didn't actually realise consciously that there was such a strong link with uh, a source back uh, in the Renaissance. And it's one of Donatello's very shallow reliefs from one of his uh, pulpit panels. And it's called The Miracle of the Ass. And that has a lot of layers of, well, construction, I suppose you could call it. He's, he's compressed all the picture into about half an inch or something with his illusion of perspective. And there are a series of grids and different, almost like flats on a stage set of um, action. I'd got quite a long way on with my painting uh, before I realised the number of similarities between that and, and the Donatello. Another a picture which is more sort of consciously an homage to really is one a bit later on in art history from the 17th century. There's a reference to Poussin's The Arcadian Shepherds and I've actually put a bit of graffiti on the concrete which says Et in Arcadia Ego, which um, refers to the presence of death everywhere, even in somewhere as idyllic as, you know, this sort of bosky landscape. I've actually noted that in my picture called Level. There's a piece of the concrete bridge abutment, which has some pink graffiti on it, which is also rather obscured by various bits of reinforcing fabric. But uh, you can see Et in Arcadia Ego sprayed on the concrete. My working method um, for this project is almost entirely from uh, photographic reference. But that doesn't mean one picture. People often say, oh, did you use a photograph? Uh, I rarely ever use one photograph. I use dozens for each picture. With this particular series, I've taken, you know, two or three photos and cut them up for sort of relevant elements and then collaged them first. Then use that as a starting point. There's a mixture of one little snippet of time. It's not, it's what you can do in painting and you can't do in photography. You can only take what's there in photographs. But one of the great things about painting, for me, is actually putting more than one episode together. It's like your memory. It jumbles things up quite a lot. So, uh, well, it does mine anyway. So that's basically how I get pictures started. My main material is oil paint. I've been dealing with high-vis jackets as a, quite a strong element in this series. And people say, can you get brightly coloured paint for that especially? I say, no, you just mix it from what has always been used 
uh, in oil painting. Uh, it's just pure skill. And so, <laughs> so I paint in a very traditional way. I use, as I say, use oil paint, I prime my surfaces well. I use a dark ground to work on. And that's a very, you know, very traditional approach to oil painting, sort of pre-impressionist. So you're working from dark to light. My wife has always remarked about how fast I work to start with. It really is slamming everything in as quickly as possible. It doesn't matter about making you know, mistakes, especially uh, when I go into schools, people are obsessed with making mistakes. And I, you, it's just not important at all at the start of the picture. You just cover the surface and uh, work into it from there. Why the focus on the working man? Well, when I think back, some of my happiest times have been when I've been doing manual labour. Uh, after I'd left college and didn't have any money, I went to work at the local um, builders merchants in St Neitz. And it was actually the first paid job I'd had. When I went to work, it was great. There was all that banter and camaraderie and stuff, which apart from being a student, I hadn't really experienced much of. And also people do tend to get a bit um, snooty about people who work with their hands. When I was at the timber yard, I remember some relatives visiting and my auntie, she was very dismissive or disappointed that I was working in the practical part of the business and not in the office. So it became a family joke where we'd say, oh, have you been down the yard? The people that I paint, they're very physical, they're very skilled, and they're doing jobs of, of great worth. And with the rise of technology, there's a sort of a feeling that manual skills are being overlooked, as far as I'm concerned. I just get this feeling that there's swathes of people who, who might be more or less lost now in the, in the new ethics of employment. As to documenting uh, the A14 after it's finished, well, I don't know to be honest, but I suspect that this is the most interesting stage for me. It's a bit like the circus coming to town with all these uh, activities and uh, all the complexity of the constructions and the colours. It's absolutely fascinating. I don't know. I really don't know. <laughs> <laughs>